Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Lauren Moran will present widely prescribed stimulants and the risk of psychosis in young people with ADHD. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $408 million to fund more than 5,900 grants around the world. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Lauren Moran. Dr. Moran is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and psychiatrist in charge of the Schizophrenia and Bipolar Disorder Inpatient Program at McLean Hospital. She was the 2013 Young Investigator. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Moran's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time following the presentation. I'll ask as many as possible in the time allotted. And now I am pleased to introduce Dr. Moran. Lauren, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much. So um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, widely prescribed stimulants and the risk of psychosis in young people with ADHD. Um, so I'm having a problem advancing my screen. If you can just click on the slide, <clears throat> try it one more time on the slide. One more time. Okay, yep. great. Um, so I have no relevant conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, and just as a reminder, the two main types of prescription stimulants are methylphenidate and amphetamine. Methylphenidate um, is kind of more familiarly known as uh, Ritalin or Concerta, um, and that would include methylphenidate and the more active form, dexmethylphenidate. The amphetamines include amphetamine combined with dextroamphetamine, which is uh, the brand name for that would be Adderall. Uh, dextroamphetamine and lisdexamphetamine, which is a prodrug that is converted into dextroamphetamine, also referred to by as Vyvanse. So clinical guidelines for ADHD suggest that both of these uh, stimulant types have similar effect sizes in treating ADHD symptoms, and there's not a clear preference for one over the other. These drugs are very commonly used. Um, in 2016, six million children um, and adolescents were diagnosed with ADHD. Um, and amphetamine, uh, dextroamphetamine, was the most commonly abused prescription drug by high school seniors. Um, and uh, 16 million adults used prescription stimulants in the, in the past year, um, with 5 million reporting misuse. Um, so th in, re in response to uh, spontaneous reports of psychosis and mania in individuals treated with stimulants, in 2006, over a decade ago, the FDA conducted a review of the randomized clinical trials for prescription drugs. There were 11 psychotic events in the stimulant arms and notably none in the placebo arms. But these were short trials. The average patient was only followed for 23 days. Um, but this study led to um, a change in the stimulant labels where they said that stimulants may cause treatment immersion psychotic rheumatic symptoms in patients with no prior history. And despite the high prevalence of these two stimulant types, there's been no comparative studies of the risk of psychosis or mania. So all stimulants have in common that they inhibit the dopamine transporter, which takes uh, dopamine that is released uh, from one terminal to the other back into the synapse, um, which, which causes more dopamine to remain in the presynaptic and the postsynaptic space. Um, all stimulants also cause release of of um, dopamine into the terminal. In studies of patients with psychotic disorders, uh, previous studies have found uh, repeatedly that amph 
if you give a patient amphetamine, it causes dopamine release, and that release is much higher in patients who are psychotic. The amount of dopamine released correlates positively with psychotic symptoms, such that the more dopamine that is released, the more uh, increase in psychosis the patients report in response to amphetamine. So I, I'm just going to briefly talk about a study that we performed uh, looking at the age of onset of psychosis. We basically recruited 205 patients from McLean, Psych McLean Hospital who were being treated for psychosis, mostly schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder, but a few with bipolar or mood disorders with psychotic features. And we asked, we wanted to answer the question, do patients who have used prescription stimulant use prior to the onset of psychosis have an earlier onset? Um, as you can see from this table, the patients who were exposed to stimulants were um, younger, more likely to be male, um, were also um, more likely to be using cannabis, but had similar levels of education and IQ. And after controlling for the confounding factors shown on the previous slide, we found that prescription stimulant use was associated with a three-year earlier age of onset of psychosis. We also found that male gender cannabis use and a family history of psychosis was, were independently associated with an earlier age of onset, replicating uh, existing findings in the literature. So one possible explanation for this finding, it could be that uh, driven by cognitive deficits. We know that cognitive deficits are associated with an earlier age of onset. Um, and perhaps the relationship was driven not by the stimulants per se, but by the cognitive deficits in those prescribed stimulants. However, when we controlled for IQ, uh, we actually found that IQ was not associated with an earlier age of onset in our study, and it did not change the, the finding of stimulants being associated with an earlier age of onset. And in our study, um, there was actually similar IQ and education levels in the, those exposed and not exposed to stimulants. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna talk about the main study uh, that's the focus of this talk, where we're comparing the relative risk of psychosis uh, between the amphetamines and methylphenidate. While all the stimulants have two mechanisms in common, amphetamine is more of a releaser. Previous studies have shown that amphetamine causes four times more release of dopamine compared to methylphenidate, whereas methylphenidate is more of a blocker. It has more potent inhibition of the dopamine transporter. Studies in patients with schizophrenia show um, that there's an increased presynaptic dopaminergic capacity, which is an index of the amount of dopamine released. And even in patients who are at risk for psychosis, they have an intermediate level of dopamine release compared to healthy controls without psychiatric illness in patients with schizophrenia. Um, in contrast, dopamine transporter, which is the main point of action of methylphenidate, uh, meta-analysis suggests that there's no significant change in dopamine transporter availability. So this led us to the hypothesis that amphetamine is associated with a greater risk of psychosis compared to methylphenidate because the changes um, associated with amphetamine on presynaptic dopamine release more closely parallel those observed in psychosis. So to answer this question, we used real world evidence. Um, we basically used two insurance claims databases. One is called Optin Informatics, which is United Healthcare. And the other one is IBM Market Scan, which is a collection of commercial employer-based insurance plans. So in insurance claims, uh, whenever a doctor sees a patient, they diagnose them with an international classification of disease code that indicates what the diagnosis they were treated for, and we have the dates of service, other information such as type of visit, type of provider. Um, and whenever a patient picks up a prescription at a pharmacy, um, a an electronic insurance claim is generated that has uh, detailed information on the type of drug, the dose, the day supplied, et cetera. And that is really the gold standard for measurement of drug exposure. So with the patient's uh, member ID, you can link the diagnosis information to the prescription claim uh, data. So to be included in our cohort patients, we looked at patients from the ages of 13 to 25 years of age. They had to have at least one outpatient ADHD encounter, no prior use of amphetamine or methylphenidate in the past year because we wanted to look at new users. They had to have continuous enrollment in the insurance plan and continuous prescription drug coverage for the past year. 
And we looked at the individuals who started either amphetamine or methylphenidate between the dates of January 1st, 2004 and September 30th, 2015. We excluded patients with a previous diagnosis of psychosis, looking at all of these codes here. We also excluded patients with the previous diagnosis of bipolar disorder, who used antipsychotic or mood stabilizer, who had central nervous system disease or narcolepsy, another reason why stimulants are sometimes used. And we also excluded patients who used other stimulants not typically associated with ADHD treatments, such as fentramine. And because steroids um, can cause and what can precipitate mania or psychosis, we excluded patients who used steroids in the past 60 days prior to starting their stimulant. So this is an overview of the study design. Um, we had that washout period with patients had no use of previous stimulant. And this is where we applied the exclusion criteria and measured a potential confounders. The date of cohort entry was the first prescription claim filled for methylphenidate or amphetamine. We started follow-up seven days later, and we followed patients basically until the, they stopped drug, they experienced psychosis, they switched to the other stimulant, uh, death, um, end of enrollment, or end of the study period. So when we looked at the two databases combined, there was one about 1.5 million patients exposed to stimulants in one database and 3.8 in the other. After applying our inclusion exclusion criteria, uh, we were we had about 300 over 300,000 uh, new users of methylphenidate and amphetamine, and we used a method called propensity score matching to ensure that the patients were well matched in each of the cohort on a one-to-one -one basis. So for every patient who received methylphenidate, there was one patient who was mat uh, with amphetamine who was matched. And we used a method called propensity score matching, where you basically use a model to, uh, to measure, to assign, to define uh, what confounding factors are associated with the exposure to amphetamine versus methylphenidate, and you balance those across the two, two groups. Uh, propensity score matching works as well as randomization with the big exception that it cannot uh, adjust for unmeasured confounders. So the covariates that we used for our matching model included demographic factors such as age, sex, year of cohort entry, what part of the United States you lived in, what type of insurance state you have. We looked at potential markers of ADHD severity such as comorbid oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder, use of non-stimulants used for treatment of ADHD, asthma, as um, previous studies have shown that patients with asthma have a more severe ADHD. We also controlled for other psychiatric medication use, um, a variety of comorbid psychiatric conditions, as well as um, substance abuse utilization and diagnoses. Um, and sometimes uh, one is uh, skeptical of how accurate these diagnoses might be. Um, so we conducted two studies to validate our outcome. First, we used an external electronic health record database from Partners Healthcare. Um, and this database, we actually had the diagnosis billing data, but we also had the detailed notes. We can verify that a patient did or did not have psychosis. So we basically created a very similar cohort, um, and we followed the patients who were started on stimulants until they either experienced psychosis as defined by a single psychotic diagnosis code, or their data ended. There were a total of 65 patients who had a diagnosis of psychosis, but only 24 of the 20 of the 65, um, 24 of the 65 actually were not psychotic. The most common finding we found was that it was a, really a typo. If we looked at the billing data, for example, there might have been a series of codes that said 296.3, which is moderate depression, um, and uh, there was a one two ninety five point three in the middle, which is a site of schizophrenia, paranoid schizophrenia. So if somebody made a typo, for example, but if we added an antipsychotic medication um, to the di psychosis diagnosis code, that improved the accuracy with a positive predictive value of ninety three percent. We also validated the um, outcome of psychosis in our own data by looking at the claims histories for all the patients who developed psychosis. Um, and we did this blind into what stimulant they were prescribed and found that um, the positive predictive value was still very high, 91.3% in both databases. And actually, there was a slightly higher false positive rate in the methylphenidate group 
which, which if anything, would have biased our results towards the null. So one of the, when we looked at the uh, data, we noticed that some very interesting prescribing trends for adolescents and young adults. Um, first, the, um, in this figure, amphetamine is represented by blue and methylphenidate is represented by green. And the older the patient is, the more likely they're be, to be prescribed amphetamine. So a 13-year-old has about an equal chance of being started on methylphenidate, but by the time you're 25, you're much more likely to be starting on amphetamine when you're diagnosed with ADHD. We also noticed a striking increase in the use of amphetamines over the study period. In 2005, um, you're equally likely to be started on amphetamine or methylphenidate, but as the study went on, um, more patients were being started on amphetamine. And when we, we actually look at this uh, on a national level, at the beginning of the study in 2005 to 2006, in this figure, the states um, that are blue means that there was a preference for being started on methylphenidate. The states that are uh, red, there was a preference for being started on amphetamine, and the depth of the color indicates how strong that preference was. So you can see that most states in the early period where providers were starting their patients on methylphenidate, but by the end of the study, most states, um, almost all the states actually, patients were being started on amphetamine. So as for the results, um, the propensity score matching worked very well and created very balanced groups. The patients were on average 17 years old, um, more likely to be male. Um, the South has uh, much higher rates of prescribing of stimulants in our databases. And they were also well matched on measures of ADHD severity, as well as um, psychiatric diagnoses. And we found that amphetamine was indeed associated with an increased risk of psychosis compared with methylphenidate. So the, the pool estimate of 1.65 suggests that you have a 65% greater chance of being diagnosed with psychosis if you're starting on amphetamine. And we actually found that that finding was consistently increased across the two databases and the propensity score matched cohort. Um, so to test the robustness of our results, we conducted several sensitivity analyses. We used more stringent definitions of psychosis, such as requiring you either had to be hospitalized or have two outpatient visits with a diagnosis of psychosis and an antipsychotic medication, and found that the risk estimates were slightly higher when you use more stringent definitions of psychosis. Um, when we looked at the so in this figure, we have the number of patients being started on amphetamine by the year of cohort entry here. On the right axis, we have the number of psychotic episodes. So the number of psychotic episodes is represented by the dashed line for people started on amphetamines and the solid line for people started on methylphenidate. And you can see that the uh, number of psychotic episodes per year very closely matches the prescribing patterns, which um, is also consistent with our findings. So one thing that's important to point out is that the study was not designed to measure how often psychotic episodes occurred. It was really designed to compare the relative risk of psychosis in individuals started on amphetamine versus methylphenidate. The episodes were rare, um, about you know, a tenth of a percent of those on methylphenidate versus 0.2% of those started on amphetamine. Um, the, we actually had a very short follow time, and the primary reason for this is because we stopped following people after they st stopped the stimulant. So if they went off the stimulant, they were no longer being followed for psychotic events. So the average duration of follow-up in our study was about four to five months. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that we only captured people who had psychosis and were started on antipsychotic medication. Many uh, psychotic events that occur in the context of stimulant use um, are transient and can be stopped without needing treatment um, by just stopping the stimulant, for example. So we are really capturing more severe cases of psychosis. In fact, 77% um, of those started on amphetamine who experienced psychosis were hospitalized as compared to 62% of those started on methylphenidate who experienced psychosis. So we had very high levels of hospitalized patients in our study. And if we do calculate the incidence of follow-up, um, 
for every uh, 100,000 people treated with, with amphetamines for one year, there were 323 who experienced a psychotic episode. That was 188. And then we also looked at randomly selected patients who were never prescribed stimulants that were matched uh, to the stimulant groups on age, gender, and year of cohort entry. And we found that the rate was lower at 84 per 100,000 person years. Another interesting finding is that most stimulants actually, family, family doctors are actually the most common prescribers of stimulants. And uh, we saw, found that in contrast to pediatricians, they have a much stronger preference, nearly threefold higher preference for starting individuals on amphetamine. And that's likely related to the age of the patient they treat. And we looked at a, the analysis by provider type. We found that the risk of psychosis, increased psychosis with amphetamine compared to methylphenidate was um, much higher for family doctors and pediatricians compared to psychiatrists. And there's multiple reasons why that might be the case. Um, psychiatrists might be better at picking up subtle symptoms that might think the, the patient is at risk for psychosis. So they might choose to use methylphenidine, which is perceived to be less potent, um, or they might choose to not treat that patient with a stimulant at all. Um, psychiatrists also tend to see their patients more often. So if a patient develops subtle symptoms of psychosis, they might be more likely to stop the stimulant before it actually leads to the need for treatment with them um, and a psychotic medication. But we don't really know the exact reason why we found that relationship. Um, so we conducted additional sensitivity analyses. This is not a randomized placebo-controlled study. It's an observational study. It's not randomized. So there's always the potential for bias and confounding to affect our results. But what we can do is kind of systematically rule out alternative explanations for our findings. For example, maybe the patient started on amphetamine had more severe psychiatric comorbidity that was not captured well by the claims data. So we performed a negative control analysis where instead of looking at the risk of psychosis, we looked at the risk of having an emergency department visit or an inpatient hospitalization for major depressive disorder without psychotic features and found that there was no increased risk. Um, it's also possible that patients prescribed amphetamines have more severe ADHD that was not captured by the claims data. If this was the case, we would expect to see greater severity of psychosis in the amphetamine group well after stopping the exposure to stimulant. So to remind you of the study design, we used an exposure risk window, which basically is the period after stopping the stimulant from the time where we counted the events that occurred, any psychotic events as part of our outcome. So you can imagine that if a patient experienced psychosis here or here, you would be more likely to think that was related to the stimulant. If a patient ex was uh, experienced psychosis way out here well after stopping the stimulant, it's less likely that the stimulant was the, was the cause. Um, and we found that if we modified this exposure risk window, um, the closer we were between stopping the stimulant and counting the psychotic events, the higher relationship was. Whereas we stopped the counting the psychotic events 90 days later, the relationship became lower. And this pattern that we observed is sort of consistent with attributing the psychotic events to the stimulant. Um, we also did a, an analysis um, by comparing patients who were diagnosed with ADHD um, who were never treated with the stimulant. Um, I'm a bit cautious about this analysis because it was very low power and the Patients who were not started in stimulants had much higher levels of psychiatric comorbidity and substance use disorders. But nonetheless, our findings were consistent with the main findings, which was that the amphetamine compared to ADHD patients who never treated with stimulants was greater than the relationship with the methylphenidate compared to those same patients. Um, another possible explanation is that the patients prescribed amphetamines were like more likely to be abusing other substances that could have led to increased psychosis, like cannabis, for example. So we performed some additional negative control analyses looking at um, emergent encounters for any substance use disorder, alcohol use disorders, cannabis, opioid use disorders as the outcomes, and found that there was no significant increase um, or no significant difference between methylphenidate and amphetamine in causing substance use disorders. We also conducted a bias analysis using data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, 
We estimate that about 13% of patients use cannabis in the past month in this age range. Patients with ADHD have a almost threefold increased use of, risk of cannabis use. So we increased our estimate of the prevalence of cannabis use in the methylphenidate users to be 36%. Um, and so the prevalence of cannabis use in amphetamine users would have to be 97% compared to 36% to fully explain our findings, which seems an unlikely scenario. And finally, another possible explanation, well, were patients prescribed amphetamines more likely to abuse their stimulants? We know from the literature that immediate release amphetamines are, most, are the most commonly diverted and abused drugs by college age students and that the rates of stimulant misuse and abuse are higher in college students than in younger patients. So if greater abuse of amphetamines as compared to methylphenidate was driving our effect, we would expect to see a greater effect size in college age students and those prescribed immediate release medications. But in fact, we actually found the opposite. The effect size was higher in the younger patients and was higher when we compared extended release amphetamines to methylphenidate or the pro-drug Lisdex amphetamine to methylphenidate as compared to the immediate release comparison. So the effect size is lower. Why would that be the case? One possible interpretation is that because the immediate release amphetamines are more likely to be diverted, um, it might be that some of these individuals prescribed immediate release amphetamines were not taking them, but rather were selling them or giving away the away to their peers. So if anything, the um, abuse of the stimulants might have actually masked or minimized the finding in college age and the immediate release amphetamines. So the strengths and limitations of the study, uh, we had a very large sample size. We had consistent findings in the two healthcare databases. We used an, a new user active comparator design, which is known to be less prone to bias. The propensity score matching method led to very well-balanced groups on measure confounders. We validated our outcome and additional analyses supported conclu our conclusions. However, it must be noted again, this is an observational, non-randomized study. We lack detailed data on the patients and we, there are several unmeasured confounders we did not control for. We didn't have data on race or ethnicity, socioeconomic status, although most of the patients in the study um, have commercial insurance. We didn't have data on people getting Medicaid, for example. Claims data also does not have data on family history of psychiatric disorders. And although there is data on substance use, substance use is generally underreported in this type of data source. So the question is, should this affect clinical practice? On one hand, the events were rare. Um, it was really, um, the focus of the study was new users who experienced psychosis early in treatment. A recent network meta-analysis um, published in Lancet Psychiatry showed when they kind of looked at efficacy versus tolerability and acceptability, they recommended methylphenidate for adolescents, but did find that amphetamines were more effective and better tolerated in adults. Although these, this meta-analysis was based, again, on the very short-term randomized control trials that are available. On the other hand, when you have a rare event, it can be clinically significant in the setting of a common exposure. As millions of patients in the United States are currently prescribed amphetamines, the risk we observed in our study translates to thousands of patients across the country that might have been conferred an undue risk of psychosis. And this is especially important when an alternative option that is effective um, is available. And I wanted to kind of briefly mention that one of the things that I learned in doing the study is that um, the United States has much higher rates of stimulant prescribing compared to other countries. So this is Medicaid market scan, which is the commercial database that we use for our, our country, published in a different paper, Translational Psychiatry. Um, and the rate of stimulant use in European countries, Australia, Asian countries is much lower. And when I reviewed the literature on uh, stimulant prescribing practices in other countries, um, in many Asian countries, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, only methylphenidate and non-stimulants are actually used for ADHD. They don't use amphetamines. And amphetamines are rarely used in some European countries. I think the only countries besides the United States that use significant amounts of amphetamines, to my knowledge, are Canada and Australia.
but we, we've seen it, especially in adolescents and adults, amphetamine use is common and growing. And the U.S. is the only country, especially for this age group, where amphetamines are used more than methylphenidine. Um, I wanted to briefly mention the use of stimulants and bipolar disorder, which was not the focus of our study. We actually excluded patients for the previous diagnosis of bipolar disorder because we were just looking at healthy patients with ADHD um, who were otherwise free of bipolar disorder or previous psychosis. There was one study published in the American Journal of Psychiatry that found that methylphenidate increase, increases the risk of mania in those with bipolar disorder who are not taking mood stabilizers. But if you are taking mood stabilizers, then that protects you from having mania after starting methylphenidate. There's really no data on the, the safety of amphetamines in patients with bipolar disorder. And what we found as uh, this is data from the two databases is that the use of uh, the prevalence of amphetamine use in patients with bipolar disorder is increasing. So as recently as 2016, um, more than 10% of patients with bipolar disorder are started on amphetamines, even though the labels for these drugs warn about the risk of precipitating mania in such patients. Um, so future directions. The psychotic events were rare in the study, so I think what we're focusing on next is to try to hone down and identify those patients most at risk where we may make, want to make a different prescribing decision. So we're going to be looking at patient characteristics such as depression, do they have a family psychiatric history or a history of psychosis in a, in a relative? Are they using other substances like cannabis? We also want to look at prescribing patterns. It might be that lower doses of amphetamines are associated with a relatively low, low risk, but higher doses, for example, might be associated with an increased risk. We want to look at dose. We want to look at how frequency patients are being monitored. It might be that it might be a better idea to monitor more patients more closely when you first start them on a stimulant um, or when you're increasing the dose to sort of be able to capture such events before they lead to hospitalization. We're also going to be looking at high risk use. So that would be represented by patients who might have concerning prescribing patterns, such as overlapping prescriptions, or if they're co-prescribed um, other controlled substances, such as like benzodiazepines or opioids. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge my collaborators at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, McLean Hospital, and Massachusetts General Hospital that um, contributed to the uh, comparative study of amphetamines and, and um, methylphenidate. I also wanted to thank the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation for their support, as well as the National Institute of Mental Health. So the take home points are that prescription amphetamines are associated with an increased risk of psychosis compared to methylphenidate. The study really focused on psychotic episodes that occurred early on in treatment after you were initially started on these drugs and that the events, um, although concerning, were rare overall. So thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Lauren, very, very much. Um, really a fascinating study. And I think you did a great job explaining the thought behind the study, the process of the study, and then obviously these important results. Um, so I, I want to just start um, by having you emphasize a point, um, which is the, the study was looking at a comparison between two types of medicine. Mm -hmm. The occurrence of psychosis is rare, but in large numbers of people taking it, it occurs a good amount of time, um, so it's in, important. And um, you found that the risk was was greater with amphetamines. But I want you to clarify that even though the risk is greater with amphetamines, there still is some risk um, with uh, medicines such as um, Ritalin. Is that a correct sentence? You know, I think it's hard. It's really difficult for us to determine with our study whether this is the case. Um, when we, when I kind of showed that slide where I, we found, we looked at the general population, there was a, I think it was 188 events per 100,000 person years from methylphenidate versus 84. But that doesn't account for the fact that ADHD itself is a risk factor for psychosis. So I don't think we actually know the answer. There have been some studies suggesting that methylphenidate might not be associated with an increased risk of psychosis. 
But the FDA study, when they reviewed their um, randomized controlled trials, they did find uh, many, you know, of those 11 psychotic events, many of them were due to methylphenidate. Um, so I think the jury is out on that, and we need to do additional work because it is definitely known that ADHD itself is associated with an increased risk of psychosis. There was a study done by investigators in Taiwan where they found that the the risk of psychosis was was much larger in, in ADHD, irrespective of what type of drug, and they found a slightly increased risk of psychosis with methylphenidate. But there's been other studies that have not found the same thing, so I think more work is needed. But you can, you can see why that ADHD would be associated with an increased risk of psychosis. It might be that some of the patients who are in earlier stages, the prodromal stage, before they actually have psychosis, they are known to have cognitive deficits. And it might be that those cognitive deficits, when they are presented to the, a treater, the treater might think that might not recognize that this is a prodrome, but thinks that, that it's, you know, adolescent onset ADHD. So I think it's difficult to say one way or the other. So for um, somebody listening right now whose um, child or adolescent or for a young adult who um, may be getting a diagnosis of ADHD, Mm -hmm. What should they be thinking about when it comes to treatment? Um, I think that it's important to be monitored carefully when you first start the treatment. And um, what I wonder is that I wonder if, um, you know, psychiatrists, we usually do a very comprehensive history on patients that we're seeing. And we ask, we routinely ask about substance abuse. We routinely ask about family history of psychiatric illness. And I wonder if that's not being done. I mean, I don't really know, but maybe that's not being done by some of the family practitioners. So I think it's important that people prescribing stimulants uh, take into account, does the person have a family history of psychosis? Um, asking the patient, um, do they use cannabis, for example, which is known to also have an increased risk of psychosis, albeit rare. Um, so just uh, taking those kind of other risk factors into account when, make, when making a decision for your child about what should be started. So while you, you already said future studies that you're going to do are going to look at this family history issue, if somebody does have a family history, that would make someone perhaps err a little bit more on the side of caution. With yes. Regards. Yes. Yeah. And the reason why I started to do this work was because um, I'm a psychiatrist on an inpatient unit for people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorders. Um, most of the patients that come to our unit present with psychosis. And because McLean Hospital is in the greater Boston area, we see a lot of college-age students, and I was seeing a lot of college-age students presenting with psychosis in the context of stimulant use. Um, so I kind of wanted to increase awareness about this um, by doing this type of research. Well, you are, and it is important for people to know about this. So thank you for doing that. Uh, one one question that I have, I don't know if you have information or I have a little bit, maybe even a little bit. Um, we've seen in, in, in the press, in the uh, medical literature, the, the, the tragic increase in suicides. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you were able to um, obtain any uh, information in this about suicide risk with regards to, to these medications. Yes, I, I don't really have an answer to that. The data sources that we have do not have um, very accurate death data. They, they might have death data about if someone died while they were hospitalized, but we would really need to link the data to another um, reliable source, such as like, uh, like there's a national death index or working with a state who had um, you know, um, vital records. Um, but we didn't really have accurate data. There were very few people who died in the study um, during the study period. Um, so we would have to do use additional data sources to really look at that. Okay. And uh, again, I know the follow-up that you had was not for an extended period of time, but based on, on this research and maybe also on your own clinical experience, um, what, how often is the psychosis transient and really dissipates um, with, with time versus uh, persistent psychosis that continues? Right. So my experience as a 
person with more expertise in psychotic disorders, I routinely take people off of stimulants, but I don't really prescribe them. When I've talked to child psychiatrists, um, I was just talking to someone um, earlier this morning, their, their experience, people who prescribe a lot of stimulants say that um, usually these events are very transient and usually they stop shortly after stopping the stimulant. Um, but you know, we have seen cases at McLean um, these are probably the rare cases, fortunately, but we have seen patients that have needed hospitalization, um, have had relatively long hospital stays. Um, it might, you know, if you have a, a serious psychotic episode that requires medication, it can take, you know, weeks to months for that to resolve fully. Um, and one instance, another question that I get asked, asked a lot is, uh, well, is are these episodes ever persistent? I mean, we don't really have the answer to that. It might be that there are patients that we see who have a stimulant-induced psychosis who go on to actually have schizophrenia, but you know those patients may have gone on to develop schizophrenia regardless, but it might have just have happened a little earlier because of the stimulant. But it's very difficult to determine whether the stimulants cause um, persistent psychosis or not. I think most often it's a transient psychosis that resolves fairly quickly. Okay, but, um, so and the important thing is to capture, to diagnosis and detect it as early as possible, because at some point psychosis tends to, if left untreated, it tends to get worse and sort of, sort of develop a life of its own, you know what I mean? And then it becomes much more difficult to manage. It could lead to hospitalization and a longer stay. The, um, I, I want to just sort of put into a broader context um, that these are rare and it shouldn't there's always the balance of too much isn't good or too frequently isn't good but we don't want people who really would benefit from yes, this treatment to shy away from the treatment and i'd like you to comment on that yeah i mean i think prescription stimulants are very effective for the treatment of adhd um, symptoms there's been studies that show that for example people who use stimulants are less likely to have car accidents um, you know, and a lot of people find them to be very extremely helpful and help them function, help them help them function better. So I'm, I'm not trying to say that stimulants should be shouldn't be used. Um, and uh, this actually, it's also important to to note that if you're if you're already taking a stimulant or your child is taking a stimulant and they're doing them well, if they're taking them as prescribed, there's no reason to think that that they should be taken off a of stimulant by any means. I mean, it's also important that you shouldn't, I don't think it's really worthwhile to, to not use a stimulant because of a very small risk, but you know, it might be, you might want to consider using methylphenidate or maybe even using a non-stimulant if your child has other risk factors. And in what, whichever type of stimulant you might use, whether it be, well, certainly you want the psychiatrist or other treating professional to keep a close eye, but you yourself as parents um, should also keep a close eye for um, what might be uh, early symptoms of psychosis. Yes, I would agree with that. Yeah. The, um, and ha is there a time frame that those uh, psychotic symptoms occur after starting the medicine? Um, I think on average, we found in our studies, it was about four months after starting. I mean, we had a couple of events occur, you know, in the first, we did some additional analyses where we started follow up the day after they started the symptom. We had like two events that occurred in the first week. Um, but I would say most of them on average occurred about four months later, which was also might be due to how long the patients were followed up. And not so much necessarily from this research, but from your clinical experience, is does there appear to be a greater risk of this in people taking stimulant medicine who do not have a diagnosis of ADHD, but may be taking it to, um, inappropriately taking it to help them study? Right, yeah, I'm not really sh quite sure about that. We've seen, uh, I think generally we see um, patients who are getting prescriptions more likely to have the events, but we also have seen many patients who are using them to study, but, but are using them often enough that they decide to get themselves a prescription. You know, so, and, you know, I've had patients who tell me, 
you know, everyone uses this, this one doctor in the area because they know that they're willing to prescribe stimulants and they might actually over amplify their ADHD symptoms because the diagnosis is very nonspecific. So we've had patients who will get themselves a prescription even though they're initially, they're really using them to study. Um, so it's really difficult to say. I think in general, the more you, the more you use them or the, the higher the dose that's used in my clinical experience, though we haven't looked at that in the research studies, um, I think that the patients that we're seeing are using higher doses and are using more of them, like using them on a, a regular basis. Okay, very, very helpful. Uh, one, one person asked a question uh, about other, perhaps less severe, um, but more common adverse events with, with either uh, type of the stimulants. Um, do you have any information that you could share about that? Yeah, we didn't really um, look at that specifically. It's very difficult in this type of data to look at things that are more, um, you know, more subjective. I mean, having a diagnosis of psychosis is a pretty concrete thing in a way, um, and it's it sort of um, often leads to a diagnosis code. Um, but we didn't look. Sometimes there's been reports of people being more agitated or having, you know, positive effects. Like sometimes uh, they're used for treatment-resistant depression. And people find them then they might enhance mood when combined with an antidepressant but we didn't really look at things like that and then because of my clinical experience i i, I specifically treat patients with psychosis if it's i don't really have a lot of experience with with other types of adverse events right right they're, they're, they're coming your way because that's the adverse event that occurred or that's the diagnosis they have exactly the um, it, it, do you have a sense of why there is this very big difference um, between the classification of medicines used in the U.S. versus in most of the other countries around the world? Um, you know, I'm really not sure. It's um, it's kind of interesting because I've I've read some books about the history of stimulants in the United States, and we've. I think other countries have had sort of negative experiences in the past, but so has the United States. I mean, there was a use of amphetamines, I called benzedrine in the early, you know, in the 20th century. And uh, they weren't, really before the diagnosis of ADHD, before we really had knowledge of that diagnosis, they were actually marketed towards um, people with depression or anhedonia. And you, you, they were often, I've seen some sort of a, pharmaceutical advertisements where they kind of were marking them towards housewives to make it easier to do your, you know, to do, to clean your house, like in the 50s and stuff. And, um, you know, they did have experiences of people having, getting addicted or, or people having psychosis. So that kind of led to, um, you know, a moving away from using amphetamines. And it went down a lot as there was publicity about, you know, the, the negative side effects that they were being abused, that people could develop psychosis. And then um, it's sort of kind of, we've had another upswing um, as it's been learned that they're helpful for ADHD. Um, so I think other countries have also had negative experiences with amphetamines, but they, um, so they've remained somewhat cautious about using them widely. But I, I don't really have a great answer as to why they're used so much more often in the United States. The, um... well, it, it's a very interesting differential and even the, the frequency of ADHD diagnosis, I think, yeah. is, is different as well. Yeah. And then um, when, I, when I often talk to people like child psychiatrists or other doctors who prescribe stimulants, and I tell them about this, I, I, I found that most doctors don't realize that. They're like, oh, well, I didn't know that. I didn't know that amphetamines aren't really used widely in other countries. Um, so I think that uh, I'm not sure if it's, uh, you know, marketing or what are the factors that have made, led to the increase in use. You know, I think definitely one thing that's led to the increase in use is that there, the recognition that ADHD can occur in adults. So there's been a large increase in the use of stimulants, mostly amphetamines in adults. I mean, I've actually looked at data in patients going up to 64 years of age, and we're seeing that amphetamines are being used more often by, in most age groups. The um, I want to get to, and this may be more on your, the clinical side of your experience. Um, in 
people with bipolar disorder. Um, mm -hmm. What has been your experience in terms of the use of stimulants and you know, what are the circumstances that they used and, and how does that typically work? Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen, we've seen a lot of patients, the, we see a lot of patients with new onset mania with psychotic features um, because it's known that stimulants can precipitate mania. And I've also uh, had patients who were prescribed stimulants because of cognitive deficits associated with the psychiatric illness. Um, and it seems that, you know, it might be that just like methylphenidate, that if you're on a, if you're on a mood stabilizer or an antipsychotic medication, that might protect you from any effects of worsening the mania or precipitating mania in somebody with bipolar disorder. Um, but I think we need to look at that systematically given, you know, the sharp increases in the use of amphetamines in patients with bipolar disorder. I mean, I think one thing that to keep in mind is that especially with a patient who has a severe form of bipolar disorder that is um, accompanied by, by psychotic symptoms, which can often be found in manic episodes that lead to hospitalization, is that patients often don't have really have insight into their um, psychosis. I mean, by definition, psychosis is kind of characterized by a lack of insight. So they might think they might be hearing voices or having experience that they're being followed or somebody's after them. And they believe that's real, so they are reticent to take the antipsychotic medications, but they always ask for their stimulants. The stimulants seem to be reinforcing. And I've had many patients who want to continue taking the stimulants, but don't want to take the antipsychotic medications. So I think it's important um, to keep in mind, like how confident are you that this patient is going to take their mood stabilizers and antipsychotics if you're going to start them on a stimulant? That really goes more to providers. Because I have had patients who were prescribed antipsychotics but weren't taking them, but then were taking their stimulants, and then not surprisingly, they, they wind up getting hospitalized. So there's a way to monitor or maybe use long-acting injectables in that type of person if you're going to use stimulants. That might be a better way to go. It's very good advice. Um, and the clinical indication in let's say a person who has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder to take the stimulant, is that there's a concurrent diagnosis of ADHD? Or what, what are the clinical situations that one would um, yes, feel I mean, makes there's, sense? There's certainly a lot of um, overlap. Um, there's a lot of, there's like, there's a lot of, there's many studies that actually show there's um, an overlap between bipolar disorder and ADHD. Um, so a lot of patients who are diagnosed with ADHD might go on to develop bipolar disorder. Um, as they enter the at-risk age range for that diagnosis, or there's a lot of younger patients who have ADHD and bipolar disorder. I've certainly seen families where the patient has come in, several families where a patient comes in with, um, you know, a, a stimulant-induced uh, manic episode with psychotic features, and then I meet members of their family, and they say, yes, everyone in our family has ADHD, but not bipolar disorder. So there's definitely a genetic risk and overlap between ADHD and bipolar disorder. So it kind of complicates the treatment because there's an overlap, but on the other hand, you have, people are concerned about potentially precipitating mania. Um, no, very, very important point. And let me ask, um, given that we are in the midst of the pandemic, um, what have you seen with regards to um, clinical issues uh, as related to to the pandemic currently happening? Um, yes, I haven't been taking care of patients uh, during this pandemic period because I'm uh, right now just kind of uh, funded by research. So I've been working on research, but um, I do know that um, there's been some changes in prescribing practices. Uh, for example, usually because stimulants are scheduled, amphetamines and methylphenidate are scheduled two medications as classified by the Drug Enforcement Agency, which is um, the highest level of risk uh, besides illegal drugs. Um, and be before the pandemic, you had to have a written prescription. Um, so a doctor couldn't just call in a prescription to a pharmacy. You had to have a written prescription and you're, you weren't allowed to have refills. Um, because it's scheduled to, but they've kind of relaxed the rules a little bit so that you don't have to have a written prescription. Um, and also, 
this is actually consistent with before the pandemic, but you don't have to, you only have, are required to see a patient every 90 days um, if you're prescribed a schedule two medication. So you can prescribe, you know, three prescriptions that last 90 days. You just have to kind of say, don't start the next one until a month from today. Don't start the third one from two months from today. Um, but I guess my concern would be that that could increase you know, the lack of detection of psychos psychotic symptoms. We are seeing that uh, there's, uh, there might be like less use of the stimulants because people are, you know, have, haven't been going to school. Um, but I think it's, it'll be something that, that's interesting that we can look at um, by looking at our data and, and from McLean Hospital as well as data in these larger data sources to see what the impact of COVID-19 is. I mean, in general, our census has been down. Um, I mean, we actually decreased our census to kind of be able to better enforce uh, social distancing, but we're also finding that people are reluctant to come to the hospital, you know, a, a fear of um, potentially catching COVID-19 in a hospital setting. So I think um, the aftermath is really something that's unknown, so we'll have to see how that, it might be that we sort of once things open up a bit, that we see a deluge of patients that have been really trying to hold it together at home who might have sought treatment earlier, but we're just avoiding coming to the hospital. So we'll have to see how that unfolds. Well, obviously very important, very interesting. Um, I, as we conclude, I, I, I'm, you, you stated your take on points. I want to emphasize one that I think you made very clearly and have you comment on it, which is, the importance of being monitored carefully and closely and not sort of here's some medicine and go take it and you know we'll, we'll see you down the road but really careful monitoring um, to make sure that there aren't uh, the onset of these side effects and that there is the, the beneficial therapeutic effect right absolutely and that might be, it might have been one of the factors that uh, led to the lower risk of um, the lower increased risk of amphetamines in the psychiatrist. Um, when I've talked to, you know, I've just talked to a few uh, family doctors that prescribe stimulants, and they, they say that they usually do, um, and some pediatricians, they often will uh, give a three month supply of the medication and see the patients every 90 days. Um, and psychiatrists see, you know, we see our patients much more often than that. Um, so I think it's important to, especially if you're concerned about somebody who might have mis risk factors to, to monitor them more frequently, or if it's a child, to tell the parents to make sure that they're keeping an eye out. Um, I think uh, I've had parents kind of say that they weren't aware, you know, when they have had children that have been hospitalized at McLean, saying they weren't aware that this was a potential side effect. And um, I don't, I don't. On the one hand, it could scare parents away from using it, but I think it's important to know that this is a potential side effect. It's very rare. And these are the things that you can look out for. I think these are all extremely important points. I want to thank you for this presentation today, but more importantly, the work that you have done and continue to do on, on this important topic. So thank you very, very much. And thank you for the opportunity to present my research. It was a, it's my pleasure to be able to share this information with the public. Great, thank you. I also want to thank everybody for joining us today. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. All the research we fund is made possible through supporters like you, so please consider making a gift by visiting our website, bbrfoundation.org, or calling us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with family and friends, please visit the events and webinar page on our website. I hope you'll join us again in August when Dr. Andrew Nirenberg, Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and Director of the Doughton Family Center for Bipolar Treatment Innovation at Massachusetts General Hospital will present an update on treatment of bipolar disorder. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, August 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Once again, thank you for joining us.
and stay well and stay safe. Take care.